When Street Fighter II hit the arcades in 1991, it was a phenomenon changing the world of gaming forever and putting fighting games on the map. Indeed, defining the modern fighting game as we know it. But within that phenomenon was another mini-phenomenon, Chun-Li. Though not the first fighting female, her place on the Street Fighter II roster rose her to prominence. An attractive lady kicking ass in a stylish Chinese dress drew in a great many people and inspired many Street Fighter II clones. Oh yeah? Well, our fighting game has two sexy fighting ladies. Well, ours has three, and so on, before someone finally said, wait, what if they were all sexy fighting ladies? And so the all-girl fighting game subgenre was born. Initially the realm of chintzy porn games with titles like 1992's Metal and Lace Battle of the Robo Babes and 1993's The Queen of Duelist and The First Variable Geo, most of these were strip fighting titles. Beat your opponent, see them naked, bada boom, bada bing. But there was one fighter which took another route that went for cuteness over titillation, made their game non-pornographic, and put the all-girl fighter on the map changing the subgenre from degenerate trash to the hidden gems of the import gaming scene. And then it went beyond, inspiring many and having a profound impact on the fighting game genre, practically birthing what we now call anime fighters. That game was 1994's Asuka 120% Burning Fest. Our story begins with a small Japanese developer called Fill In Cafe, very small, practically an indie. After a few decent games, most of which involved Mecha, they had another one in development for the Sharp X68000 FM Towns computer systems called Mad Stalker. It was a side-scrolling single-line Mecha brawler with quick attacks and flashy combo options, which played sort of like a proto-Guardian Heroes. Mostly because it literally was. After completing it, the game's two main programmers, Masaki Ukyo and Masatoshi Imaizumi, were hired by Treasure as they were very impressed by Mad Stalker. Together, they began work on a four-player Mad Stalker-inspired fighting game on Genesis called Axion. Ukyo stayed with Treasure and turned Axion into the Yu Yu Hakusho fighter we know today, while Imaizumi left, went back to Fill-In Cafe, and decided to use its engine to make a fighting game. An all-school-girl fighting game called Asuka 120% Burning Fest. This would hardly be their first fighting game. In 1993, they had made Algunos on the PC engine, and Mad Stalker does have a versus mode too, but Asuka was the start of something new. The plot of Asuka? Every year at the school festival, the Mega Fight Tournament is held. Every club sends a fighter, and whichever club wins, they get extra funding that year. But wait, wouldn't the sports clubs beat the ever-loving crap out of the nerd clubs? Exactly. Enter our heroine, Asuka Honda of the Chemistry Club. She's received special training from an upper-class woman named Tetsuko, so the Chemistry Club can finally win and get some much-needed funding. But Asuka Honda will have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her rival, Karen Toyota of the Biology Club, with her attack dissection frog. But that's not all. Torami of the Karate Club actually lost last year to Tamaki of the Tennis Club, the new reigning champion, and the principal's daughter. But she's a senior, so this is her last chance for a rematch. Meanwhile, the principal himself has money riding on little cheerleader Megumi. Could he be pulling some strings behind the scenes? Then on the outskirts of the school lurks Shinobu, a gang leader from a rival school, also itching for a crack at Tamaki, after having been beaten by her in an underground fighting tournament. And so begins the Mega Fight Tournament. For the record, this is the plot of the entire franchise. Every game is technically a remake of the same game with no actual forward plot momentum. Heck, most of the games even have the same win quotes and story mode dialogue. Anyway, the very first game was made for the FM Towns computer system and ported to the Sharp X68000. The X68000 was an impressive piece of tech when it came out in 1987 and served as the dev unit for both Sega Genesis and CPS1 games, it being the very computer system Street Fighter II was programmed on. But by 1994, it was starting to get dated. Heck, it was discontinued in 1993. But it had a dedicated following and filling cafe soldiered on. The FM Towns, meanwhile, was produced from 1989 to 1997 and was consolized into the FM Towns Marty in 1991, making it the world's first 32-bit game console, and Asuka straddled that line between the 16 and 32-bit generations. This first game had only six characters, but it played rather well, taking clear inspirations from the sorely underappreciated Power Instinct, which came out only four months earlier, Asuka features very versatile double jumps and quick combos that let you string multiple jabs into one another. 94 is the year I like to call the dawn of the combo, as while combos had always been a part of fighting games, a logical side effect of hit stun, 
Late 93 was when Super Street Fighter 2 first implemented the combo counter, and 94 is when a lot of the earliest combo-centric games came out. Games like Darkstalkers, X-Men Children of the Atom, and Killer Instinct, which elevated combos from a mere mechanic into an obsession. Asuka, though, felt more anime than all of them with its quick speed, easy chains, and high maneuverability. But it also did something else interesting. Recognizing that their game was on a computer and that buying a six-button pad just to play a tiny no-name fighter from a no-name dev was BS, they built the game for keyboards. Using simpler inputs like down forward instead of a full quarter circle and down down instead of a show Ryukin motion, and using only two buttons, weak and strong. This made the game highly accessible for anyone just playing because they liked the cute girls without sacrificing depth, much to my surprise. Asuka was never built as a simplified fighter, just a regular fighter that had simpler inputs, a minor difference in mindset with a major effect on the game. But if there's one thing that defines Asuka 120%, it would be the clashing. In fact, some folks are saying Asuka may have actually invented clashing. So what do I mean by this? Well, what happens when two attacks of equal priority hit at the exact same time? In some fighting games, both attacks register and the two characters both get hit and knocked back. But in Asuka, the attacks clash and nullify each other. This has become a bit of a staple of the anime fighter genre, but Asuka takes it to a new level. Near as I can tell, every attack seems to have the exact same priority, and as such, everything clashes, resulting in wild clash duels, where both players' strikes repeatedly nullify each other. You can literally block by attacking. The game also had two other interesting things about it. One was seemingly a glitch, where pressing both buttons simultaneously could cancel dash attacks, opening up major combo options. The other is that, for some reason, it has no forward dash, but it does have a back dash. An oddity shared by a certain other fighter that came out later that year. Sailor Moon S for Super Nintendo, Arc System Works' first fighting game. It does make me wonder if they were inspired. By the end of the year, a new Asuka 120% was released exclusively for the FM Towns. Asuka 120% Excellent! had the same roster and similar gameplay to its predecessor, but added in a new adventure mode where you travel around the school and talk to people between fights. You know, it's easy to look at Asuka 120% and see it as a 2D all-girl version of rival schools. Initially, I had considered this a coincidence, only to now remember that Asuka 120% Excellence Adventure Mode is rather similar to the Japanese-only school life slash dating sim mode of rival schools, which, for the record, is the main game mode, and you guys have no idea how much we actually got screwed out of when we lost it. It's really good. So now I wonder if Asuka may have inspired rival schools. Pretty likely, really. During all this, a group called Kogato Studio worked with Phil and Cafe to port Mad Stalker to the PC Engine, being one of the scant few games to require the arcade card. Something likely seen as a mistake because the following year, Kogato would once again approach Phil and Cafe to bring Asuka 120% to the PC Engine, this time as a System Card 2.0 game. This game would be known as Asuka 120% Maxima, and while it ditched Excellence Adventure Mode, it added more characters and further expanded the combat. By pressing both buttons simultaneously, your character leans into the background, evading attacks. Also, your life bar flashes when low, and in this state, you can do super moves by doing an attack input with both buttons. In fact, you get infinite supers when you're low on health. Now, you might have noticed the graphics. The PC Engine is a strange beast. Known as the TurboGrafx-16 in North America, it was a massive flop here and a huge success in Japan, utterly curb-stomping Sega and putting fear into Nintendo, all thanks to the power of its CD-ROM drive, the very first in gaming history. The system itself, though, is almost comically underpowered. Though that makes sense since the system was first released in Japan in 1987, two years before the Sega Genesis. It only has a 16-bit graphics chip. The actual CPU is 8-bit and almost identical to that of the NES. Its real power lay in its system cards. These were used to store data from the CD-ROM drive and somehow caused a massive boost in system power. The 1.0 system card was little more than duct taping a CD-ROM drive onto an NES, but System Card 2.0 boosted the system up to proper SNES and Genesis levels, with the majority of the game catalog being released as System Card 2.0 Super CD-ROMs. This is where the PC Engine classics like Rondo of Blood come in. System Card 3.0, aka the arcade card, came out in 1994 and tried to make the now 7-year-old system compete with the incoming 32-bit era. It was only used by, like, 11 games, most of which were Neo Geo ports. 
Hence, Asuka going back to System Card 2.0. Though the system was technically discontinued in 1994, the PC Engine was beloved enough that it saw game releases into 96, two games in 97, and its final game hit in 1999. Either way, I have no qualms with saying that Asuka 120% Burning Fest Maxima is easily the best fighting game on the system. That said, though the PC Engine is the only console to receive fantastic home ports of both Street Fighter 1 and 2 while they were still new, it didn't really have many fighting games released for it. Mostly just the Neo Geo ports, which were good for what they were, Flash Hiders, which was more story-driven than anything else, and Algunos, as mentioned earlier, a Far East of Eden fighter, which was okay, and Asuka. The thing is, the PC Engine's default controller is only two buttons, meaning you had to buy a six-button pad to play pretty much all the other fighters. But Asuka's brilliant two-button design not only made it a perfect fit for the standard controller, but its quick combo-y gameplay makes it feel far more modern, too. Sure, Street Fighter 2 and Fatal Fury Special are classics, but why would you play their decent PC Engine ports when you could just play a direct arcade port these days? Meanwhile, Asuka 120% Maxima still holds up and feels unique compared to its successors and thus is still worth playing today. Now around that same time, the company's success made a sequel to the Super Nintendo game Kendo Rage, called Makaruna Makendo 2, and it's a shockingly competent fighting game on SNES. Really feels pretty good. Well, Phil and Cafe was called in to do the PS1 version of it, and it is pretty Oscarful. It really needs to be said that it is not a port. The sprites and gameplay feel very different, so I highly recommend giving both a shot, as the SNES version from Success, again, is quite solid for the system. But the PS1 game is what happens when the Asuka crew makes a more normal-ish fighting game. You can still feel the Asuka-ness beneath it with how combos chain and feel, but you do have more buttons and more normal inputs, as opposed to the easier inputs of Asuka 120%. Either way, this is significant because it's Phil and Cafe's first PS1 game, and it clearly lays the groundwork for the fighter to come. This brings us to the dawn of 1996, and Masaki Ukyo over at Treasure releases the 2D brawler classic Guardian Heroes, building off the gameplay mechanics of Mad Stalker. Yeah, I wasn't kidding when I said Mad Stalker was literally a proto-Guardian Heroes, and Treasure has never been shy about this fact, often citing Mad Stalker alongside Capcom's Aliens vs. Predator as major inspirations for the game. Two months later, the first Asuka 120% for PS1 came out. Asuka 120% Special, and it is special, with very rough-looking cut-out scans of the original art and some kinda off-looking sprites I have no qualms with saying that I think Special is the worst looking game in the franchise. So of course it's the Japanese tournament standard, but no, 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 not this Asuka 120% Special. This one. This one is crap. You want to play this one. You can tell because it has a dot in the corner, see? Okay, so apparently, shortly after the release of Special, an updated version was released, and the way to tell the difference between the two is that dot in the corner. This fixes some bugs and makes some balance tweaks, as such is the Japanese tournament standard. If you don't have the case, the way to tell the difference between the two is to go to options and set the time to infinite. In the options menu, it will always show the infinity symbol, but in-game, if it shows 99 on the timer, that's the old version. If it shows the infinity symbol, that's the new version, called Special Version 2 by fans. That's the one you want. So as much as I've basked the visuals of this game, they do still have some charm. Namely, the backgrounds, which have a nice 3D effect and have tons of animated background characters, giving them more life, as well as cool visual effects like the reflective mirrors in Kumi's stage. These are probably the best backgrounds in the series. Special, though, lays much of the groundwork for the rest of the series going forward. Now you have a super meter, and you can do supers at 100%, or, once it reaches 120%, you get infinite supers for a limited time. Pressing A and B simultaneously now causes you to do a universal counter move that costs a little bit of meter. Beyond that, it continues Asuka's traditions of two-button gameplay, easy inputs, and fast-paced combo-y combat, albeit perhaps even more combo-y than before. This game also introduces Shinobu as a boss character, although she's completely tournament legal. While we're here, this is the same year Tecmo releases the all-girl fighting game Toki Densho Angel Eyes, which introduced a homing dash mechanic similar to what Arcana Heart would use years later. It also awkwardly blends 2D and 3D pre-rendered characters together into a visual mess of a game, though it is still fun. I find this noteworthy because this is the first time a larger company has made an all-girl fighter, and probably the first all-girl fighter to hit actual arcades. It shows the concept was gaining traction, and had truly broken out of the hentai pits that spawned it. 
This then brings us to 1997, what must be Fill In Cafe's busiest year. Taking the engine from Asuka 120% special, Mad Stalker sees a PS1 version, which, although it adds some new stuff, is generally seen as inferior to the other versions for some reason. Apparently it's slower on the default settings? Meanwhile, Asuka 120% would see the release of Excellent on PS1. But wait, didn't Excellent already come out back on FM Towns? Yes! The PS1 version of Excellent takes the graphics and gameplay of Special and combines it with the adventure game-like story mode of Excellent to make a new Excellent. Shinobu is now part of the default roster, and the art has been redone by Atsuko Ishida, the artist behind Money Puzzle Exchanger, Magic Knight Rayearth, Shamanic Princess, Maho Shonen Majorian, and Brave Police J Decker, among others. Weirdly though, this game is not as well liked as Special Version 2. I have no clue why and would love to know, but generally speaking, Japan sticks with Special Version 2. But 1993 isn't over yet! Masatoshi Imaizumi releases a new brawler on the Asuka 120% Mad Stalker engine titled Panzer Bandit. Yes, widely regarded as a Guardian Heroes clone, it is in fact the game's twin brother. I mean, Guardian Heroes Masaki Ukyo and Panzer Bandit's Masatoshi Imaizumi both worked on Mad Stalker, split apart, and both made games based on its mechanic and engine. But what makes this even more fascinating? Apparently it is widely reported that Panzer Bandit is based on the unreleased treasure game Axion the game that became Yu Yu Hakusho on Genesis, with the character designs being inspired by Axiom. Regardless, yes, Panzer Bandit feels like Asuka 120% as a brawler divided into two lines instead of Guardian Heroes' three-line system. You have four playable characters, some wonderfully big-handed sprites, and the maid dude has this lightning ball attack I want you to remember. Might remind you of a certain Xbox Live Arcade game, and with good reason. But following this August release of Panzer Bandit, Two months later came Asuka 120% Limited for Sega Saturn, and now we're talking! This, this is what a timeless classic looks like. Beautiful sprite work, a camera that zooms in and out, fast-paced, wonderful gameplay, and even a bit of an anime opening. Asuka 120% Limited finally evolves the game into something the average player could look at and go, yeah, that? That looks like a good fighting game. And indeed, there were even talks with Kaneko to bring this sucker to the arcades via Sega's Saturn-based STV hardware. Unfortunately, the game had problems. As it turned out, Torami and Kathy were really good, players figured out their best combos, and high-level play devolved into doing those same combos over and over again as seen in this Japanese exhibition tournament. No other characters matter. No other strategies mattered. Asuka 120% Limited was a solved game, though it is inspiring to see no 100% infinites or the like in actual tournament play. Even when solved, people still had to hit with a couple best combos to win. So it does hold up almost okay! All this game would need is an update and then fill in Cafe filed for bankruptcy. Despite pushing out four fantastic games in 1997, I guess they just couldn't recoup the costs or something. The arcade version of Asuka 120% Limited was cancelled and the best looking game in the series was left in a sorry state. And yet, that didn't stop them. In September of 1998, a website appeared on the internet containing a .lzh file for a patch to turn Asuka 120% Limited into Asuka 120% Limit Over, rebalancing the game and adding new moves through an online patch in 1998 on dial-up. Someone from the original staff released a balance patch for their game despite being out of business. I can't help but be in awe of the dedication. Unfortunately, in order to run this patch, you would need to rip your copy of Limited to a Japanese-compatible computer, apply the patch to it, then burn it to a disc and run it on a modded Saturn. And most Saturns that can play imports actually can't play bootleg games. So for years, this game was out of reach to most people in the West, becoming something of a legend. But now, thanks to the internet, we can finally play Limit Over and I need to explain this thing. So this is what it looks like when you boot the game up. That's right, no title screen, no company logos, no graphics. This is a tournament patch and it has completely cut out all the fluff that would slow down loading times. I mean, after all, if you wanted the fluff, you could just play the copy of Asuka 120% Limited that you legally own and ripped in order to make your copy of Limit Over, right? So yeah, no win quotes, no graphics on the character select screen. And that brought in a little problem as the original version's name were completely in Japanese, so you didn't know who you were selecting. Big thanks to Misty DeMeo for releasing a translation patch for the character names. I'm saluting you here. 
Anyway, now that we have access to a rebalanced version of the beautiful Saturn game, this has become the Western Tournament standard. What can I say? The game looks nice and appealing visuals help sell a game. That and the game does have two new tournament legal characters, previously hidden bosses and limited. They are now available by default. Tetsuko, Asuka's trainer, and Genichiro, the principal of the school and the only male character in the series, are now both playable. It's worth mentioning that Limited and Limit Over make use of the Saturn 6 button pad by having a variety of shortcut buttons, including one button for just pressing it in a direction for special moves, as well as a separate maneuver button that can be pressed for dashes instead of double tapping. Shamed as I am to admit it, I do use these buttons as there's a scant few things I find difficult to do in this game. Namely, short hops. The normal input is to double tap up to short hop, but pressing down plus maneuver also does a short hop, and oh man, does that open up some nasty options. Considering how easy these moves are to do normally, and there's only like a few things that might snag a few players, I don't think anyone has an issue with someone using the shortcut keys. But somehow, despite the developers being out of business, the series isn't over. In 1999, Success, the people who previously made the Super Nintendo version of Makaruna Makendo 2, made Asuka 120% final for PS1, and the bane of many Asuka fans' existence. Now, Final isn't a bad game in its own right. It's fun, beautiful, and feels great. But it's the technicals that cause it to fall apart. See, Asuka 120% is kind of a big series. So if a newcomer were to look at the franchise and wonder which one they should play, they'd likely gravitate towards Final. After all, it's basically the last one or so they think, so it should be the best one. It looks the best. It's on PS1, so it was easier to deal with than Limited until just recently. So most people casually browsing through the series play that, have a blast, and laugh at what a fun Kusoge that was. And as an Asuka fan, that hurts, because I'd honestly argue that Asuka 120% may well be one of the greatest fighting games of all time, and not a mere Kusoge. So what's wrong with Final, aside from not being made up by the original devs? Well, while it uses the same sprites as Limited, notice anything different about the gameplay? That's right, the camera doesn't zoom out. We have these big sprites, but they're trapped in a small space now, instantly ruining any longer-range characters while making these short-range characters overpowered. Attacks have been made to hit a whole lot more times, and a new custom combo mechanic has been added. While previous Asuka games had players struggling to get 20 hits, Final allows for 50-plus hit combos just by smacking your face on the controller. Not that it'll do much damage, as damage has been nerfed so hard that most matches will only be won by timeout rather than KO. Honestly, I'm not even sure if poor Kumi can win by KO at all. So a fun game. Heck, it even makes the announcer girl a hidden playable character after all these years, but not a good representative for Asuka 120% as a whole. I really don't mean to crap on the game so much as, again, it is fun in its own right, just very weird. But not the weirdest, because then they released a Windows game that same year called Asuka 120% Return, and I've never played it, and looking at this footage, boy, do I not need to. Woof. Once again, based on limited, but just weirdly jank? Lower color background, slower speeds, sprites not matching up right? Yeah. And so ends the tale of Asuka 120%, but not its influence. In 1998, the year after Phil and Cafe went bankrupt, Sims would release the Saturn game Soko Setokai Sonic Council, which, while not all girl, was more female centric and seemed to take some inspiration from Asuka 120%. That same year, Variable Geo would ditch the hentai and evolve into a truly great all-girl fighting gem with Advanced VG2 for PS1. Then a man named Nobuta Narita came along. He made a doujin company called Watanabe Saisakujo and had been making goofy desktop accessory programs with a friend when he stumbled across the budding doujin fighter scene on the Sharp X68000 with games like the Tokimeki Memorial fighting game Tokimeki Tyson and the Magic Knight Ray Earth vs. Evangelion vs. Sailor Moon vs. Tenchi Muyo game Moonlights 2, and of course, Asuka 120%. These all-girl fighters inspired him to make one of his own, Queen of Hearts 98, an all-girl fighter based on the dating sim 2 Heart, with moves and mechanics heavily inspired by Asuka 120%. The game would be voted Doujin Game of the Year in 1998. Watanabe Saisakujo would become one of the most famous Doujin game developers. Queen of Hearts 99 would soon follow, then Party Breaker Queen of Hearts 2001, then Glove on Fight, which was more of a boxing game and featured two characters from the visual novel Tsukihime. 
Then, Narita and his now growing crew decided to make a full doujin fighter based on Tsukihime. As they did, they changed their company name from Watanabe Saisakujo to French Bread. And the game they made was called Melty Blood. The rest, as they say, is history. And yes, Masatoshi Imaizumi is even credited in the special thanks for Undernight Inbirth EXE latest. But this wasn't the only major game inspired by Asuka 120%, as also in 1998, what a year, a man named Daisuke Ishiwatari was combining his knowledge of multiple fighting games he loved to produce the very first Guilty Gear, and he would credit the Gatling combination system as being inspired by Asuka 120%. That and clashing. Some Asuka fans even claim that Soul shares Asuka's run animation, and I think it's a little questionable. Soul definitely leans into it more, but I can see the similarities. I'm actually surprised how well this synced up, really. This seems hard to believe now because Guilty Gear has become so huge, but back when it all began, Guilty Gear was practically as borderline doujin as Asuka 120% was. Friendly reminder that the first game did not have an arcade release. But that was where Asuka 120% made waves, not with the big companies like Capcom, Namco, and Sega, but with the doujin scene. Asuka 120% showed that a small team could make a great fighter. They showed how fast and fun a fighter could be, how inputs could be simplified, how high speed and maneuverability added to a game, and that all-girl fighters didn't need to be porn for people to want to play it. It was in this doujin zone that the anime air dasher we know today was born, and Asuka 120% could be considered the mother of them all. With Darkstalkers as a father and Power Instinct as the grandmother, because of course Power Instinct is a grandmother, don't at me! But is this really where the story ends? Of course not. Masaki Ukyo would continue working at Treasure until they became nothing more than a holding company. It was then that he joined back up with Masatoshi Imaizumi, and together, alongside visual novel developer 5PB, they made a game called Phantom Breaker on Xbox 360 in 2011. The game was a spiritual successor of sorts to Asuka 120%, with the same wild over-the-top clashing encounter system, but this time built for simple gameplay with semi-automatic combos and simple button plus direction special moves, which at the time of its release were new and controversial ideas. The game was slated for a Western release, but Microsoft-based complications and a lack of interest from the FGC tanked the release, among other things. Masaki Ukyo would then go on to help make the Guardian Heroes-like Code of Princess on the 3DS in 2012, before joining back up with Imaizumi again to produce Phantom Breaker Battlegrounds on Xbox Live Arcade in 2013, a pixel art side-scroller which could be considered the spiritual successor to Panzer Bandit, what with that very familiar electric ball attack and all. This had no issues getting a US release, though there would be much drama about its many re-releases and revisions. Let's not get into that though, because I can barely remember them all. Just, I swear, every new release had a new problem. That same year, Phantom Breaker would receive an updated version called Phantom Breaker Extra, which adds in four new playable characters, all unfortunately pre-rendered CG that Clashes horribly with the hand-drawn cast is giving me horrible angel eyes flashbacks, but it is what it is. This was released on both 360 and PS3, but only in Japan. Shortly afterwards, an arcade port titled Phantom Breaker Another Code was released on the Sega Ring Edge arcade system. This added Infinity, the end boss as a playable character, but cut out the two guest characters, Kurisu and Rimi. This was the last I heard out of them until 2020, when suddenly, an unreleased Genesis version of Mad Stalker got finished and released. Rocket Panda Games had gone to Japan to discuss Phantom Breaker's lack of a US release, and inspired the crew to begin work on a new entry called Phantom Breaker Omnia, which looks to have all the content of both the original and extra, and some new content, with Imaizumi back on board. Imaizumi would also work on a brawler called Ogre Tail, which I admit to being slightly disappointed by, really. Phantom Breaker Omnia would finally see a US release on March 15th of 2022. And while I personally prefer Asuka 120%, I still look forward to Phantom Breaker 2. And that's where I thought this video would end? Only for Asuka 120% out of freaking nowhere to come back! Two and a half new Asuka 120% games were announced just recently. The first is Asuka 120% Reborn, a combination of Ribbon and Reborn for the Sega Genesis. 
This looks to be based on the Sharp X68000 version, but looks to add in characters from later in the series, along with a guest character from a recent visual novel. I look forward to this because the X68000 version of Asuka 120% feels very different from the rest of the series, and having an easier tournament version of that is exciting. Later, Rebon will be ported to Switch with a newly added adventure mode under the title Asuka 120% Rebon EE. I assume EE stands for Extra Excellent? Then, Asuka 120% Own You, or All New, will be released for modern systems with pre-rendered CG sprites which fans are already complaining about before any have even been shown. Not that I can blame them, I'm complaining too! But Masatoshi Imaizumi did just release this new Asuka 120% video he made in Miku Miku Dance, and it certainly gives me hope for the future. Actually, based on this acrylic standee publisher Opera House is selling, it does look like this is Asuka's new design for Own You. Can we take a moment to appreciate the leg strap with the vials of chemicals in it? I think it's a good touch. But while Asuka 120% was certainly influential back in the day, is it still worth playing today? Absolutely! While its successors may have evolved a whole lot, they may have also evolved too much, perhaps becoming a bit too complicated and full of obtuse mechanics. Asuka 120% meanwhile feels like the fighting game everyone is trying to make these days, but failing at. A simpler, easier to play fighting game without making something shallow and dumbed down. See, Asuka 120% was never trying to be a simplified fighter. It merely came from simpler times and wanted to be a good fighting game that could be played on a keyboard or two button pad by people unfamiliar with the genre. The result is a game that hits the absolute perfect middle ground for me easier to play than a normal fighter, but it still has inputs. Fast but not so fast I can't follow it. Lots of easy combos, but rarely more than 15 hits, so I'm not stuck in them forever. Couple this with more straightforward mechanics, and Asuka 120% is one of the most enjoyable fighters I've ever played. When I competed in a tournament for this and got utterly destroyed, it wasn't because my opponent had so much arcane knowledge that they were playing a completely different game from me, as is so often the case, but because I got outplayed. I got downloaded. I screwed up and I knew exactly where I screwed up. Everything just made sense. Well, there is no such thing as the greatest fighting game of all time as everyone has their own preferences and tastes. For me, Asuka 120% Limit Over is a strong contender for that title. As mentioned earlier, the two main versions of Asuka 120% are Special 2 on PS1 for Japan and Limit Over on Saturn for the rest of us. And honestly, both of these versions are shockingly well balanced. I don't think there's a single bad character in these games, maybe softball girl Kyoko, but otherwise the tiers are pretty close. This makes sense though, as the game has very strong universal mechanics. Everyone has a multi-directional double jump, everyone's attacks have the same priority and clash like crazy, and I'm pretty sure everyone has at least one air special. There's probably an argument that this makes the characters play a bit samey, but I think it's a good middle ground, and the characters still feel pretty darn different if you ask me. And what a surprise, both of these games are balanced patch versions of previously released games. So yeah, it makes sense that these are the tournament standards. Might be best to start with Special 2 though, since it, you know, has graphics on the character select screen. And that, as of March 2022, is where the story of Asuka 120% currently sits. Will the series make a comeback with these new titles? Could the older entries see a re-release? Only time will tell. Until then though, the series does have a small community. In Japan, the Asuka 120% scene has been keeping their passion for the series burning bright in local events, focusing on Special Version 2 for years now. Why, there's even a Japanese tournament for it coming up May 1st as part of the Kansai Gaming Party. Meanwhile, Sailor Vic is currently running the Western Asuka 120% Discord server and holds online sessions every Sunday on his Twitch channel. Big thanks to him for a lot of the gameplay footage in this video as it's more interesting than me flailing at a computer opponent. If you want to hop in, the Mizumi Wiki and the Discord will help get you set up and we've got links in the description. Anyway, this is Gel, and you've been Game Babbled. See ya!